the industry has gotten away with this, all this shit for so long because nobody knows anything about it. And I think if people start to realize and say, hello, uh, we know what's going on here and we don't want to stand for it the way it is anymore. Jocelyn Zuckerman is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Jocelyn is a freelance writer based in Brooklyn, the former deputy editor of Gourmet, articles editor of On Earth, and executive editor of Modern Farmer. She has written for Audubon, The American Prospect, New Yorker, National Geographic, and many other publications. A graduate of Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism, she served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Kenya and as a former fellow with the Washington DC based Alicia Patterson Foundation. Jocelyn has been the recipient of a James Beard Award for feature writing and fellowship from the Carter Center, the Peter Jennings Project, the New York Times Company Foundation, and Columbia University Center for Environmental Research and Conservation. Her first book, Planet Palm, was published May 2021, just last month, a month and a couple days ago. I've got it right here. Uh, this is the European edition, Planet Palm, beautiful orangutan with uh, palm uh, seeds fruit in, in his eyes. And uh, Jocelyn, I wait, welcome you to the show. It's so good to see you. Thanks so much for having me. Glad to be here. I'm so glad you can make it. And, and I appreciate you kind of working with my schedule. We had to go back and forth a little bit to, to get a time that worked properly. But you've been busy. You've been kind of doing the book launch and tour on the tail end of uh, hopefully emerging out of this pandemic and craziness. But in comparison to what I read in the book and what you've experienced on your, your planet palm, palm oil journey, oh my God. I mean, <laughs> seriously, uh, it, it, I, my, I must say it pales in comparison. Uh, it's a 10 times worse than any pandemic, in, in my opinion, um, of what's going on in the palm industry, what has going on, the long history. And you really take us on a roller coaster ride through many countries, many places and cities, and give us really the down and dirty of it. I, I want to start out with, because you've been writing for quite some time, and the, the, the research and, and the writings in this book about Planet Palm have taken you on a pretty big journey to see um, activism and, and things around our food systems all around the world. And then 2020, we were hit this pandemic and Black Lives Matters and Asian racism, a crazy inauguration and, and many other crazy things in our world. But with all that research, all that writing, all those things around kind of environment and food and, and what's going on in our world, did you have some better models for life to help you resiliently get through this time? Were you hit just as hard as everyone else? And were there maybe some learning lessons that you could share with us during this time? But most importantly, I just want to know how did, how did your family and you weather this crazy time? And, and were you all okay? And, and uh, kind of catch us up to speed. Okay. Um, so the last time I was on an airplane was... February 2020, when I went to Wisconsin to, to visit that um, company that's making synthetic palm oil that I wrote about in the epilogue of my book. Um, haven't been on an airplane since then, got back here. Um, I have been reading the news, so I was pretty aware of it coming. Others in my family thought I was crazy. At one point I bought masks um, from the pharmacy in February and they, they were all just rolling their eyes saying, you are, you're so insane. I said, I, I'm gonna, it's gonna come here. Um, Anyway, we did okay. I have two children. Um, my older daughter was supposed to start college this past September, um, but they deferred all the, the freshman arrivals till January. So she was here. She did miss her, her graduation and prom and um, she's a dancer. So she missed her whole uh, last dance recital. Um, and then my younger daughter is 15. She's a, just finished her sophomore year. Um, 
we're very fortunate. We have a, a house in Brooklyn, so we have four floors. So my husband was um, working in the basement. The 15 year old was on one floor. I was in my office on the next floor and my, um, my older daughter was upstairs. So we sort of did our thing all day on Zoom and um, in the, the early days ordering in groceries, um, as I said, very fortunate to be able to do that and came together. Sorry for the dog barking, you might hear something. You're something. fine. And, um, you know, cooked, cooked every night and um, managed to stay healthy in the early, Early on, my husband and I were both convinced that we had COVID, but um, I don't know, maybe that was hysteria. <laughs> we seem not to have, so we did okay. We just kind of hunkered down. We didn't see anybody for months, really. Um, and fortunately, out the other end now. Yeah, and, and do, do you think there was, I mean, you were obviously probably started working on the book well before the pandemic and you were you're kind of, launching at the tail end of it and probably working on it as well during during this time uh you you this is your first book am i correct correct but it's it's not your first writing you're in um more than multiple dozen uh, uh publications and you know civil eats gourmet whole living on earth on and on code blue you know uh, everything bogue mary claire you're all over so you've been writing for a while. Was that experience better, different? Was it uh, um, during during this crazy time? Um, I you know I didn't do I didn't do much freelancing during the pandemic at all because I was finishing up writing the book, um, and I have to say it was it was some good discipline for me because um, I think most of us find it really hard to to sit down and just concentrate on writing for hours at a time. But when you've got <laughs> nothing else to do, no place else to go. Um, and a deadline staring you down. Um, so, so it was, I was really just in my office sort of um, revising and, as I said, writing that epilogue and sort of finishing everything up. Um, so didn't, wasn't doing other reporting at the time. Great, great. Well, that, well that's good. It, it turned out good. And I don't know if that extra little pause hel helped, but, it, but this book is amazing. It's like a, Roller coaster ride. I was telling you before we started. I kind of like it's, it's a mix of the uh, um, mafia and cartel and uh, romancing the stone with you know Douglas uh, Michael Douglas and and uh, uh, just the adventure and crazy things that you've experienced and also um, a big portion of it. It was it wasn't just research and history. It was also your travels and. And journeys where where you went to a, a few places and um, kind of hair raising uh, experiences. How, how did we get this? This is a, we're talking about originally kind of a, a healing oil, a food product, and and what it sounds like we're dealing in plutonium or atomic weaponry or some kind of a, a arms deal. Aren't, aren't we talking about food? How? how how, how did it get there? I mean, is, uh, maybe you can kind of give us the backstory. And, and also, how did you come to, to write about this? How did you get there? Um, so I'll start with sort of the food. Yes, it's absolutely food. And I, and I make the distinction in the book between sort of the, the palm oil that is produced artisanally in West and Central Africa, which is where the, the plant is indigenous and the industrialized stuff that is now sort of in all of our junk foods and biofuels and makeup, um, which is processed and sort of has very little in common with the original bright orange um, oil, palm oil that you get from, from Africa. Um, so, and then we can sort of go back through how we got from one to the other. But how I um, came to do the book, you mentioned that I wrote for On Earth. Um, and so it was in, I believe it was 2014, I um, had the idea that I wanted to write a story about land grabs. So this was, as I'm sure you remember, um, in the aftermath of the food and fuel crises of um, 2008, when there were those protests around the world, um, fuel prices and food prices were really high, and, um, led in, in part to the Arab Spring and other uprisings. Um, and also another, another a thing that came up after that was that um, agribusiness sort of land poor countries sovereign wealth funds started looking around the, the planet for large swaths of fertile land where they could buy or rent um, 
either as an investment or to grow food, maybe to send back to their populations. Um, this tended to happen in places like um, there were there were deals written about in Ethiopia and Madagascar where sort of governance is maybe not great and um, people on the ground can be pushed, you know, there's sort of far flying and can be pushed off the land um, without that many people knowing about it. So anyway, that was the phenomenon that I wanted to write about. Um, I could have reported it from any number of places, sadly. Um, settled on Liberia in part because of the relationship of the country to the states. Um, as your viewers know, I'm sure it was founded by um, freed American slaves. Um, I also had long admired um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the, the president of the country. I would, I would be less um, admiring of her after my reporting, but at the time I, I had only read positive things about her. Anyway, so I went down to Liberia to report the story on land grabs. And I got down there and what I saw as I described in the book, um, you know, were just miles and miles of rainforest that had been cleared um, and where they were about to plant the oil palm plant and then other places where there were young early plantations of this oil palm plant. Um, they, were, they were young, they were sort of maybe three feet high, sort of like, they looked like bushes down on the ground. Um, and I just, as I said, you could, we drove for, I was with a photographer and with some local researchers and we just drove and drove and there was just like, they just, cleared land, pushed people off of their, um, out of their villages, um, plowed through their grave sites. Um, and then these plantations that were planted, again, miles and miles. And I thought, you know, what is this oil palm? How do, like, I had worked at Gourmet Magazine for 12 years and written for, as you said, these various other places about food and agriculture and nutrition and environmental issues. And I really, I knew, I knew nothing about palm oil. And yet here was, you know, just masses of, um, of land growing this crop. So that sort of planted the seed, you know, what, what is this, where, where is it ending up? Why do we need so much of it? How do I not know anything about it? Um, and then here we are, but seven years later. <laughs> so it's been, it, it has been a seven year journey then. Well, it was the sort of, I, I came back from that. I didn't start the book immediately. I think in the next couple of years, I was still doing other things, but I sort of was, was starting to think about it. And what I did was um, try to get early on sort of pitch stories to other magazines. For example, I pitched one to Audubon. I learned that um, Helmeton hornbills and other birds in Sumatra um, were endangered largely in, in part because of the, the palm oil industry going in there. So I sort of pitched stories that had to do with these different um, magazines. I pitched one to Vogue magazine because so much palm oil ends up in makeup. Um, and that, that way I got the magazines to sort of underwrite some of my early reporting trips because you can't get a book deal until you've sort of done a lot of the reporting and it's very expensive as you know, go across the world yeah. to do that report. It's very so it expensive. Slow, slow coming up. I, I wasn't sort of actively working on it until for the, just the past three years. But there was also little um, articles in different magazines and things that kind of tickled and touched upon a few of those things I did do you see some of those? I think they're 2013 may, it might've even been something before that as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but yeah, um, it's, it's amazing um, the amount of research and what comes out of this book. And it's kind of a longer journey that you take us on. So the original foundings of Unilever the company that came to be Unilever had had big dealings in palm oil. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and about um, how you discovered that and when it really began and how, how that influences different countries and, and cities around palm oil? I try to remember how I discovered it. You know, up in my office, and I have brought them down for some previous interviews, I got lots of old books. Um, sort of, you know, the economy of Nigeria in the 18th century and um, trade with, with Europe. So I can't remember exactly when I found out about the William Lever connection, but anyway, so William Lever was um, one of, I believe, 10 children um, born in the city of Bolton, a sort of an industrial town in England. Um, his dad had a grocery store and he and his brother eventually took it over um, and he was a very ambitious, he was a very, very short man, um, just laser focused on sort of growing the business and making money. Um, and so he started trade, he started um, producing soap, um, which is made from palm oil. Uh, and they were, so that already um, palm oil and palm kernel oil. Maybe I should back up and just explain the, the plant a little bit. Yeah, that's fine, please do. 
he pointed out here the, the oil palm fruit. Um, these are sort of a little bit more elongated than, than often they look. They're sort of the size of a plum or like maybe a date. And so it's got this, this orange flesh. That is where you get the, the palm oil, that orange stuff that I um, described. And that's 50% saturated fat. And then inside is a white kernel, um, which is from which you can, you get a different oil, which is 80% saturated fat. So is that palm kernel oil they were using already to make soaps um, and candles in, in Europe, particularly in England. Um, and so he, he was, began manufacturing his own soap um, and margarine. And then he decided that he didn't, he didn't want to sort of deal with the middlemen who were, who were bringing the, um, the ingredients from West Africa. So he went down to um, the, the Belgian Congo and managed to, this was in the aftermath of King Leopold, which your viewers probably know about him, um, murderous, uh, said to have, have killed um, directly or indirectly 10 million um, Congolese through uh, when he was extracting rubber and ivory to, to build his empire. Um, anyway, so William Lieber went in there afterward and he got the, the government that came after King Leopold, um, gave him five concessions, um, big plots of land around the country where he was, some of them, they there were already um, existent oil palm groves, um, but then he also was, his plan was to build these plantations um, so that he could have the raw materials directly to his factories in Europe. And he said, oh, I'm a, I'm a Christian man and I believe in, um, you know, taking, I'm gonna build them houses and schools and, you know, give them great working conditions. Um, needless to say, not exactly how, how it turned out. Um, basically the slave labor, um, in many instances, in fact, I cite in the book, um, one, um, uh, a local, um, bureaucrats who did a report of, of Lever's operations at one point. And in the end, he said, in, in some, the conditions are, are little better than they were under King Leopold. So um, a cup, they did, there was some housing for that, some nice housing, but it was for, you know, a tiny percentage of the workforce. Others were, they forced them, you know, they would, they would take these men from their villages and, and force them to move to these areas where the palm oil was being grown um, and harvest it and process it. Um, taking them away from their families um, and, and in many instances in, um, conscripting children and women into the, into the labor as well. So yeah, that's, that's sort of how he built his empire. I mean, he, um, he didn't pay much for anything at all for labor, um, got these raw materials and just kept expanding and expanding around the world. So it's amazing how long ago uh, um, around the world it, started to begin and um before the time it turned into an industrialized things where other countries were coming in and kind of uh, and other corporations were coming in and uh whether it was indonesia or borneo or wherever the different areas around the world were where they would go in in africa um to do this that the natives, the indigenous people were using using it as well for other things and didn't really always see it as as valuable or or um just kind of how an integral part as healing medicine and other uh options that were used this was used for not only the kernel but also the 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 orangey palm oil mm -hmm. absolutely in in africa still it's um you know a central part of the the cuisine and the culture they also tap the sap to make palm wine um, they used the fronds for building and yeah, used in the food in food and medicines um, for centuries. Southeast Asia, no, it, was, it wasn't grown there at all. So it was around the turn of the 20th century that um, European, Scandinavian um, planters um, took it over there and started planting it. Part, it was partly when synthetic rubber came on the market and they had they'd been growing rubber there um, and the place of, price of rubber tumbled. So they started um, experimenting with oil palm um, brought from Africa. Um, so it was not part of the culture there at all. In fact, it still isn't. It's really, it's not, it's not, it's grown everywhere, but um, this indigenous people don't use palm oil for, you know, in their, in their diets or in their traditions. That's good. <laughs> I, I would say that's good in some respect. There, we're, we're going to wait until we get closer to the end of the podcast to really kind of go into the really positive uh, a narrative of, uh, of the whole entire thing of palm oil and and what you your research and discovery is 
I've had other other authors on the show that have kind of talked about Monsanto or Bayer or uh, um, industrial agriculture and high use of chemicals and pesticides. Uh, I really think from from reading this book, it's uh, it's uh, you and the book are, are real close qualifiers, and hopefully will receive the Rachel Carson Award. I think it falls in that s- same category um, of, of awareness because it's having um, a million to billion people health wise and environmental wise impact on what the palm oil industry and what it's become today and um, uh, the damage and and also uh, civil unrest and also uh, people's lives and and just kind of a lot of of slave labor and corruption. And um, in in the book, you you speak about even, you know, some villages being burnt, you know, because people weren't aligned. And and even at the UN level, if if, uh, the FAO said something negative, about palm oil, how Indonesia or others would come in and say, well, we're that you need to retract that. That's not fair. We're going to, we're not going to support uh, the UN or support our agreements or continue those if you say anything negative about the palm oil. So uh, just a lot of corruption, a lot of influence around our food system. But out of all this research and this discovery, why? What, 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 it, is there is there a major reason why is it just sheer corruption is it is it something that uh, the system started out wrong and it just hasn't made the curve to get into something better? Um, what what is your takeaways? I think like in in so many instances we sort of you know we're we're stumbling ahead in in the name of progress um, and not not understanding the long term consequences of these things. So. I talked about how the, um, the European planters sort of moved, started planting oil palm um, at the turn of the 20th century. So right after Indonesia and what were um, Dutch East Indies and Malaya got their independence, became Malaysia, Malaysia and Indonesia, um, very large populations of very poor people. So those governments, as part of a poverty alleviation schemes, um, eventually supported by the World Bank, would move people to areas where that have been forced to clear the land, give them oil palm plantings, some rubber plantings. Um, so again, it was sort of, you know, it was trying to help these poor people make some money and have a livelihood. And then it just expanded and expanded. And certainly um, in Indonesia, um, the folks in charge were um, cronies, largely cronies of Suharto, the, the former dictator. Um, and the industry is still very much concentrated in the hands of those folks or their um, offspring. So yes, a lot of corruption, um, and, but again, just sort of stumbling ahead, you know, it, it, initially it, it wasn't all corrupt and, and it was a, you know, meant to sort of help the population, but I think things, things continue to snowball. Um, and part of the issue that we haven't really talked about why it's, it's such a problem is that the oil palm, I mentioned that it's um, indigenous to West and Central Africa. So it grows best at 10 degrees to the North and South of the equator, which is the same latitude where the where Southeast, those um, Indonesia and Malaysia are. The problem is that it's that exact swath of the planet that is home to our tropical rainforests, um, which as we know are you know massively important for sequestering carbon and home to, to our most important biodiversity. Um, and also, much of it sits on top of peatlands, which is sort of organic matter that's accumulated over millennia. Um, and the, the companies burn that, let, chop down the forest and then burn it. Um, so it's just carbon you know, flowing into the, the atmosphere for years and years. So again, you know, back at the turn of the century, nobody was thinking about carbon emissions um, or biodiversity loss. They just, it wasn't on our, our radar. So I think, um, you know, we're learning as we go and hopefully it's not too late. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully. I, you mentioned earlier around 2008 um, uh, with oil and with our food systems, how we kind of got started out and got stuck into something very bad where we t- turned food into a commodity. So at that time during the financial bubble in 2008, what was going on around the world with food and, and, and our financial problems, um, we started to invest into anything to do with the food systems and it kind of turned 
the food systems into a commodity. And when you turn food into a commodity, it's those people who grow and produce that food are doing it as a commodity, not as someone uh, incentivized by investors and not by people who are farmers and know how to produce products quickly. They just want to produce it as cheap and as fast as possible. They don't care about human health suffering or environmental suffering um, mm -hmm. or problems. Uh, um, and in return, when you cheapen food, you cheapen life. And so there, since 2008, we've kind of been stuck into this, this real bad cycle uh, with all types of food systems, but especially we've seen the rise of, of those commodities and, and palm oil and, and many other animal agriculture that are really having a big effect on human health and our environment. I want to mm -hmm. know is a lot of the palm that you research, especially now, uh, you know, since 2008 forward to, to the present day uh, of what's going on in the industries. Are you seeing that palm oil has become a commodity? Are you seeing that palm oil is just still um, industrial sector and not so much a commodity, but more an industrial sec sector product, which is um, not accounting for uh, the human suffering or the total cost uh, accounting or the true cost or the total environmental cost of the impacts of, of planning those? Are there any wisdoms or things that you've seen kind of emerging coming up? Right. And so I'm sure your viewers know this, this term externalities, right? The, the, yeah. the hidden cost of things, you know, in terms of rivers polluted, soil polluted, workers um, exposed to pesticides. And then the people who are eating. So we should talk about where all this palm oil is, go is going. 75% um, of it ends up in food. What kind of food? Mo we're not going home and cooking in palm oil, most of us. Um, so it's, it's ultra processed foods. You know, it's um, industrialized sort of baked goods, chocolate bars, ice creams, cookies, crackers, junk basically. And then also used for frying, um, particularly in Southeast Asia and India, all the street vendors are using palm oil because it's so cheap. Well, why is it so cheap? Um, partly because you know the, the land is in many cases stolen. Um, the the labor is um, in many cases slave labor, um, and so yeah, I think the the palm oil industry says, oh, you can never get rid of it because if you if you use any other kind of oil, you know, you're going to need to clear this much land. Nobody wants to talk about well, do we actually need this much oil in the diet? We never had it before. I mean, it's the the trajectory of the growth of vegetable oil in our diets is is off the chart. So it's not, you know, my argument in the book is we need, we need to sort of look at this in a holistic way, the same way we need to, we need to look at, you know, our meat consumption. Um, and as I said, those externalities, what impact is that having on, on the soil, on indigenous populations, on biodiversity, on the climate, um, and, you know, adjust things moving forward on all those levels. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, oh, no, it definitely answered the question. I mean, in, in, in the book, but also before in other articles and, and overall palm oil industry has really been likened to the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. And we, we also know, which is no big secret, um, there was a point in time where major tobacco companies were actually purchasing uh, food production companies, high, pro high processed food production companies, into their portfolio and just kind of not only the marketing, but using that same scheme and methods that they'd used in the tobacco industry also and in, in that food production industry. And so we're, we're really not seeing, we're seeing more that the manipulation tricks and kind of hacking of the system to continue to get that commodity and the, the profits and, and, and that out of the products is, is, as cheap as fast as possible and with the highest margins as possible. Um, with and also, and also of, growing their markets, right? Dumping, yeah. dumping you know, it, some populations, maybe in, in Europe, maybe in the US, where um, there's more publicity around the, the adverse health impacts of these different products. Well, maybe we can go to, to Africa and to these other places where people aren't aware, or we don't have to put labeling, you know, with the saturated fat content or. Um, so yeah, sort of dumping this stuff on, on people who might be, not be in as good a position to understand um, 
what they're ingesting. I, I totally agree. And that, that's uh, a big trend. So I do, I do a lot with food period, not just environment and sustainability, but a lot with food as well. I have a book called Menu B coming out this year as well. So uh, it's around global food reform and unhealthy things in our food and, and stuff as well. And so we speak about that a lot that uh, food it, is... It, 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 yeah. Menu B. So this is a, um, how we need to to overhaul our menu moving forward in the well, context? There, there, yeah, there's definitely no planet B for sure, but okay. there is a menu B, a different way that we can produce and, and consume and uh, do agriculture around food that's not harmful to people, to human health, and also to our environment. And and those two really go hand in hand, you know, the, the, the nation of plants uh, where we really ha have taking care of our atmosphere and our planetary boundaries to keep us humans uh, going for such a long time, not just with food, but also great oxygen and great uh, and climate and environment. So for so many uh, decades, um, uh, we're exploiting, we're not paying the true cost, we're not giving it time to regenerate. And so uh, that that's kind of where I want to go with what you talk about in your book is, is um there's too much of a good thing. I think there's probably very, especially for those indigenous cultures that have used palm oil one way or the other, that it, it, there, there is a purpose and a use that it could be used for mm -hmm. uh, as long as it remains in, within the planetary boundaries and a regenerative cycle and it's not becoming an impact on human health or on environmental issues because we're pushing all other traditional plants or other types of agriculture out or forestry out of the way to the plant palm. And so uh, I really, you know, I kind of wanted to address that, how you're seeing with all the bad and the horrific in the book that you discuss in many different countries, how they're really protecting, protecting this industry. Um, are there those who are saying, no, we need to pay for the total environmental impact of palm oil. We, we need to make sure that we're paying the water, the resources and, and, and letting the earth regenerate. Or we're paying the total, uh, uh, the true cost accounting uh, is a big thing that's just come out. The TCA, the true cost accounting of food and mm. the actual EBITDA, the environmental uh, EBITDA of food. So that's never accounted for in the process of food. You, you see a lot of the palm oil products cheaper than the labor, the harvest, the transport, the processing, the water resources, the land resources that are used in it. And that's never accounted. That natural capital is never accounted for. Do you see a slow shift in that? Or is that really one of the other main reasons why you've written the book is so that we can say, hey, we're overdoing it. We need to reel this back in. Let's start focusing more on fixing this uh, problem. Very much the, the reason I wrote it is, is so that people who are the consumers and um, you know, of these products understand what's, what goes into producing it. Um, when you talked about the indigenous people, I would say, um, yes, there's absolutely movements on the ground in so many places. Um, they've, seen, they've seen what the industry can, you know, comes in and does um, and are fighting against it. It's less a question of sort of externalities and the true cost because they've always sort of lived in harmony with nature. And it's basically, we don't want, we don't want a, you know, our forests knocked down for this monoculture. Um, and again, you know, in, in Africa, where the, the plant is indigenous, it grows in sort of agroecology um, systems. It's not, I mean, there are, there are plantations there now um, that companies have established, but traditionally and, and still in many cases, it's, it's you know, intercropped with other things. So it's, it's a perfectly sustainable system. Um, uh, but yes, definitely there are, there are organizations, I mean, there are, there are groups on the ground who've been protesting in all everywhere, Sierra Leone, Liberia. In Liberia, in fact, one of the companies that I wrote about in the introduction to my um, book, they eventually, the, the company pulled out because there was so much opposition on the ground. They had seen what this other company had done. 
um, in terms of, as I said, polluting their rivers, knocking down their grave sites, and they they fought and fought and fought, and finally the the company pulled out. So some of that is happening in some places. Um, sadly, in other places, the the industry is just sort of um, plowing ahead. In um, in Papua, in uh, on the Indonesian side of the island, that is also Papua New Guinea. There, there's the industry is still going in big, knocking down primary rainforest, tropical rainforest to establish more palm oil. Um, but there, you know, there are organizations I talk about in the book, the Rainforest Action Network, um, Greenpeace, Mighty Earth, uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch have been re reporting on the labor issues. So there are definitely sort of global groups that are working with um, more local groups on the ground to to help them get the word out and fight back. Um, it's hard because these are massive corporations with you know very deep pockets. For me, you really seem like a global citizen. I mean, you're talking uh, many different countries, uh, and I know you've been to Africa, and you've traveled around. You did a little bit with Greenpeace. Do you consider yourself to be a global citizen, and how would you feel about a world without nations, borders, and divisions of, of humanity one from another? Would that make a difference in this whole palm oil business, or in um, moving forward with some better uh, systems? That's an interesting question. I don't, I don't think I've thought through enough the sort of the policy implications, but my instinct is yes. Um, have you read the book Exit West? I have. Yeah, so um, that's sort of when, when, you, when you talk about, you know, these, these borders and um, in that book, there's, there's a, a lot of migration, a lot of it due to um, conflict and environmental problems too, I think. Um, and yeah, you, you start to think about, you know, these, these are artificial constructs, right? And we've, we're all led to believe like, oh, you can't cross this Southern border. You can't come from Mexico to come from here. Well, you, so, luck of the draw, you know, I, I happen to be born in a, in a rich country. So I think absolutely, we need to rethink all of these things moving forward, given, given the environmental crisis and that no nation is gonna solve this on their own. You know, you knock down the tropical rainforest there we're not insulated from that here in Brooklyn. It's all it's all of a piece. So um, I think yes. And you you also mentioned um, basic income before. I think all of the all of our sort of concepts of capitalism, borders, countries. We need to we need to sort of throw everything up in the air and, and figure out how we move ahead. Another book I, I read recently that I have mentioned a lot. I'm sure you've read is um, the Ministry for the Future. I, that one I haven't read, but oh, it's on my list. I haven't read yeah. it yet. It's um, it's very much the climate change focus, but um, it also looks at you know our, our capitalism and, and just how our, our organizing principles and how we need to rethink everything um, given the state of the planet right now. So yeah. the, and the reason I kind of bring it up because it's a unique tie and it's kind of a dual-edged sword in many respects. So we very much want the palm oils and the banana, Chiquita bananas. And, and I mean, Chiquita is one of the big players in the palm and Guerrero and, and other big corporations are, are as well, as well, well as a lot of uh, government and or organizational corruption out there and that. But we're... we're in a time of pandemic and even before we get this nationalistic view and we don't want immigrants and we don't want uh, migrations, and we don't want these things. But as far as the goods go, as far as the food goes, as the air quality and, and those things, we absolutely want it. And during this time, 15, 18 months of pandemic and, and uh, issues that we face, a lot of rise of nationalism, the, the global citizens were food the pandemic, COVID, obviously, air, food, um, water, species didn't uh, hold back by borders, but there was some really unique things. So, and I'm going to give you an example, and this kind of ties to some of the other things that you speak in in the book. Before the pandemic, they had the Brexit vote, and then there was the finalization, but because of the pandemic, um, that Brexit vote, now the borders were closed because of the pandemic and, and uh, the United Kingdom saw between 400,000 and 600,000 immigrant migrant workers every year coming in to produce food, harvest food from farms, produce food, serve food, gastronomy and grocery stores uh, in the United Kingdom every single year. And a big part of that vote 
was because of this nationalism, because they didn't want people taking their jobs. Also, maybe you could throw in racism in there. They didn't want people taking their jobs. Well, now Brexit was voted on, the pandemic comes, the borders locked down, shut down, no more immigrant workers are there. They've solved the problem. But all those people who made the vote didn't jump into the jobs to harvest the food or to process that food or into the gastronomy or the grocery stores. And so there was an extreme amount of food waste that occurred during that time. Plus, on top of that, the United Kingdom takes five times the landmass of the United Kingdom in other countries, Indonesia, Russia, um, Africa, yeah. all over the world to process, to process that food, to, to, to get their resources, yeah. their raw goods from other places. So that's okay. Ooh. But by damn, we don't want anybody coming to our country and living and, 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 and that because, but the food's okay. And so it's just this really, it's an it's a oxymoron. It's, I, I don't know what the right term is, but it's absolutely this insanity that, that we can make those hard distinctions, but yet it's okay to exploit other populations of the world for palm oil, for other resources and goods. And, and then when they need aid or when they when uh, there there's some issue, we're not jumping in properly to solve that. And I see when I'm reading your book this whole time, I'm seeing that that's a glaring thing for me there that that really is something that we never talk about. We don't address a, a lot. And I just wanted to get your feelings and kind of how you touched upon it in the book and how maybe it bubbles up. And in, in, in your views, because I mean, as you talk about all these colonialism and, and as your travels and the kind of the big history of Palm and then how it develops into present day, it's very a global story that you're telling. It's this very, uh, you know, one planet. We're all on the spaceship Earth. And so I just kind of, I don't know what your thoughts, I'd like to hear more of your thoughts and feelings and what, how you tie that in and what your bigger view is. So in terms of labor issues, sorry, I'm not, I'm not quite everything. Sure. I mean, everything. I mean, don't, you know, it's, it, it, I, I wish we could just say it's, it's only labor, but we're really this systemic view of life. So we're doing, we're more than just laborers. We're also eaters and consumers. And we're also, you know, have this cultural diversity. And so it's much more than just boxing us in and saying, Oh no, Mark's just a podcast guy. That's all he does. He doesn't eat. He doesn't do anything else. And but no, I have opinions on a lot of things. But I also realize a lot of the food that I eat comes from other places than just Hamburg, Germany. Matter of fact, I'd probably starve to death if I just ate food just from Hamburg, Germany. So I need to know how do my consumer behaviors or how do those big companies I buy from influence or the, the suffering or the, the environmental crisis in other parts of the world. Uh, one, one last aspect that kind of fits to that uh, as you're thinking about that answer as well is that especially with palm, especially with animal agriculture, I would say in Australia and in Brazil for the most part, and excuse my French, other countries are basically saying, hey, do you mind if we let we, we let our cattle shit in your, your land and produce methane and ruin your soils and, and that, and then you ship them as cheap as possible to us so that we can eat them in our burgers and our steaks, but you deal with the environmental problems and sell it to us at less than fair trade, fair cost, environmental cost, all those natural capital things. And a lot of people don't get that bigger picture and especially those indigenous or those people on the ground, they don't realize the cheap labor, the poor living conditions, the poor working conditions being burnt because you're, you talked about this in the book as well, when your, your, your pole touches a wire and you're burnt to death or whatever happens in the process of that cheap palm oil so it can be sold as a commodity or as cheap as possible across, uh, on the other side of the world. They don't give a damn about those environmental and health impacts that are occurring in those different places. And that's a big, huge thing in our food system it really needs to be addressed and thought about or discussed. And I think you tickle upon it in quite some ways with your story and what's going on to bring that to light. But I'd like to even go deeper if you don't mind, if you maybe have opinions or thoughts or what you've discovered in your journeys on that. 
Um, the first thing I would say is that the, what distinguishes palm oil to me is that unlike, you know, you mentioned you want your bananas, you want maybe your coffee, your chocolate, you don't wake up in the morning thinking, I want my palm oil. You know, I would argue that, um, again, this is, it's, I don't think it's consumers that have demanded this oil. It's the corporations, it's the PepsiCo's and the Unilever's who've, who are producing this junk. And I will call it junk that, um, you know, that we are buying because it's there and it's cheap. Again, we, we talked about why it's cheap, all of these, you know, the impacts that it's having on the other side of the world. But um, so I think, you know, in your book, Menu B, we need, we need to rethink, you know, what are we eating? We've got a finite amount of land. How are we going to use this land in a way that can sustain us all moving forward? I would argue, absolutely, it's not a bunch of ultra processed food, you know, largely composed of this filler, cheap palm oil. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, the other thing is, um, what's I going to say, just in terms of, of worker issues. Yeah, the Recently, the U.S. Um, Customs and Border Patrol stopped importing from two big Malaysian palm oil companies because of um, evidence of slave, slave labor um, and child labor on plantations. So, it's you know, as if we if we raise our voices and say we care about these things, then I think there there can be some changes made. But as I say in the book, and you said I you know I go to these far flung places, so much of what happens on the ground in this industry is like way off the beaten path. So, which is partly why the industry gets away with all these things. We're here, you know, in Brooklyn and in um, Hamburg eating our food. We have no idea, you know, what's gone into it and who's paid the price at the other end. Yeah, and that, that, that's sad. I mean, in Germany, they're kind of very, there's a lot of environmentalists and activists and they try to make that aware. So sometimes you'll see these um, kind of these pop-up markets in the streets to take surveys and they'll try to sell people you know a kilogram of bananas you know five six you know uh, bananas for 16 cents uh -huh. and, and it's an experiment to see who, who will take it and if there's any thought about it if it's just about the price and, and 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 they don't care where it came from how it was transported who was paid for it and, and things like that and i mean it, it's pretty philosophy there's a lot of philosophy and thought that goes into to that sometimes because people are, are hungry at the moment they don't think about all those it's a, about convenience and so they don't think about all those other things and that maybe yeah it was a mother or her child or someone who didn't you know had to work a month long to, for that 16 cents of bananas that now was shipped or what all the externalities are of environmental and uh, impacts that go along with that shipping, transport uh, emissions in the process of that. And so I like little experiments of that that kind of make food at the forefront and make us aware of what goes on behind it. And that's why I love your book because it really through many multiple stories goes through, it, it's not only adventurous, but you're like, well, this is like, um, I don't even want to say horror story, but I didn't know this was going on. This is really. that said it was like yeah. Dorian and gray. It just gets uglier and uglier as you read. Well, it, it, it's still a good read. Don't please my listeners. Don't get me wrong. It's a fabulous read. And I don't want to give, have you, have you give the whole book away. I want people to go out and buy it and read it. It's not only on the edge, interesting to read, and very positive at the end. So it's not all doom and gloom for, for those of you or my listeners who are thinking, you know, okay, uh, boy, this is just a sad story and that, but we need to be aware and be more aware of us. I say this uh, uh, quite a bit. Our basic resource is food. It's how we regulate our body temperature and uh, uh, a measurement of a caloric intake is a measurement of energy. And I don't want you to count calories, but I want you to know that's how you regulate your body temperature, keep your energy and keep going. And it would be like buying a cell phone or a car, not knowing how you're going to charge the battery or, or fill the tank with gas. The same thing is we've turned over our responsibility to food and where it comes from to 10, 20 big com companies in the world. And God knows what's, what's going into it and what kind of environmental destruction or health issues. We're seeing tons of obesity uh, and chronic diseases coming out of, of food and food issues. Um, 
around the world. And, and we need to take a little bit of closer look at how we feed our body and fuel our body in, in a different way. And so I think this is a very enlightening book of something that maybe has fallen under the radar in many respects for those just average, average day snackers who like the chips and crackers and all the, the, the goody things. Um, uh, closer to the end of the book, you talk about Nutella, and I'm in Germany. That's a Nutella. That's a German, German product. And uh, in Europe, people go crazy. I couldn't eat this shit. It, uh, sorry, I, I just don't care. I, they, there's this great uh, food company here in, in our uh, food awareness company, kind of a company that lets consumers know what's behind. And they did this great thing. They took a Nutella glass and they kind of cut it in half so you can see the inside and they break down the amount of actual uh, hazelnut butter and oils and fat and sugar in there. And I saw that once because as a kid, you know, I, I thought, wow, I love Nutella. And my grandma gave it to me all the time. And then I looked at that. I was like, oh my goodness, I can never eat that again in my life. And it's about this word. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's a, there's a big layer of palm oil in that in that process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's a pretty big one, and and yeah, I don't care how good it is. Uh, what is the awareness level of of palm oil? I mean, I know it's it's much higher in Europe. Like for example, in in Germany, are there products in the grocery store that have labels that say no palm oil on them? Or have you not noticed that? Um, I'm not sure I've noticed um, where they say no palm oil, but I all, I, I'm always one who's flipping it over, looking at the ingredients to see if there is palm oil, because I don't want to buy it as well as other like canola and, and many other different types of oils and, and um, ingredients. I just, I don't want to have them in my stuff if I don't know how to pronounce them or what there is. And, and there's, there's actually another great book. It's um, not just devoured uh, from Sophie Egan it is, is oh, this yeah. is a great book I read that. De devoured from Sophie Egan or how to be a conscious eater from Sophie Egan. She actually goes in and some of the, some of the products or the ingredients, she says, you know, this sounds bad, but it's actually good for you. And then this other one that sounds good is actually bad. And she goes through and, and, and gives you some hints and tips of where to look. But I, I, I'm one that looks. But really, that's almost sad. Why do we have to look? We, sh we shouldn't have to look. We, it, it should be another system. And uh, the agriculture industry, the food beverage industry, the seafood industry are the world's oldest industries um, ever. They're the, old, the world's oldest economy. They call it an agrarian society. Even if we're talking seafood, it's, it's an agrarian society. It's the world's oldest, longest running economy our world has ever seen. It's the most successful. Even in the time of this pandemic, all food systems Investments have gone up, uh, new uh, investments towards new startups and new food from cellular agriculture to precision fermentation has gone up because it's a vital resource. It's Maslow's basic hierarchy of needs. It's our physiological need, food, breathing, and water. Um, and and really, it's it's also the longest it's running. Climate, right? I'm not making yeah. more land, at least yeah. on this uh, and and, and it, it absolutely is. But the thing is, it's also the one that employs the most women and girls, the least amount of pay. Um, it, it's a 20 trillion US dollar industry market industry worldwide globally, which a lot of people don't know. For a long time, they thought, okay, 7 trillion, that was just Europe. And, and uh, 2021, it's 20 trillion U.S. dollar industry, agriculture, seafood, food and beverage industry. And it's just the longest running successful economy that we could ever rely upon. And it makes sense. The problem is it's still stuck in the industrial revolution. They're not using smart, efficient ways to produce. It's the least digitized industry and good, healthy products. And they're also not taking into account this total cost analysis or accounting this environmental impact on our, our planet 
to produce food and we've left this regenerative zone of producing food and kind of are starting to encroach five of our nine planetary boundaries in the wrong way. And so uh, this is really not about me or menu B or about my thoughts or feelings about us, about how this book has stimulated thoughts in me and, and hopefully in my, my listeners to go out, purchase the book, read it, understand more about palm oil and how to change your buying habits, how to influ influence those organizations to move away or not use palm oil. Um, besides Nutella at the end, your last little section, you give us some very uh, good things about what's coming down the pipeline um, for alternative palm done right. Is there such a thing as palm oil done right? Uh, do, can we have hope that, that it's a product that can be on our palates in the future? Um, I think there is such a thing. Um, I, I guess I didn't talk in the book, but I've talked about it in some other interviews. Um, I visited some um, farmers in Ecuador who were producing palm oil for a company called Natural Habitats. And these, these were not plantations, they were sort of, um, as I said, agroecology systems. They were on their own farms, small, a couple, maybe five, five, 10 acres, um, intercropped with passion fruit and other things, all grown organically. One guy had his own compost tea that he was, he was making to, to pour on his oil palm um, plants. So it's certainly possible, um, but this, this was like a very small organization. They're producing a small amount of palm oil. You know, the problem is, is monoculture plantation, but that's what the corporations want because that's where they get their, um, you know, where they can make all the money by, by just having, you know, one, one massive thing that they can farm out without having to, to use that much labor. Um, so the, the problem is the sort of industrialized stuff. If you're producing it artisanally, I think absolutely it, it can be done right. Um, but again, we don't need as much palm oil in our diet, in our world. We need to sort of rethink what that, that, that those tropical lands can be better used for. Um, and I also talk in the book about synthetic palm oil that a couple, couple different um, groups are working on. Um, I visited this, these guys in Wisconsin who are producing it from a genetically modified yeast. Um, there's also a company based in New York City called C16 Biosciences that I think last year got 20 million from um, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, the, the group formed by um, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and some others. So I know a lot of people are, are sort of looking at how we can produce at least enough, you know, the, the palm oil that we need for, um, we didn't talk about this much, but about 7% of global production is used for personal care products. So sort of Nivea's, lipsticks and things. And to me, that's, that's sort of okay. I mean, um, I think it's, you know, better used in, in that sort of thing than in junk food. So I, I, you know, concede that we should have some palm oil in the world. I just don't think we need as, as much as we're producing now and certainly don't need to chop down more tropical rainforests to keep producing more. And uh, do you, do you feel okay about the synthetics or do you, do you feel about okay about the, the, the kind of the lab based, maybe the potential of a lab based type of a palm oil coming up a replacement or or what, I mean, do you have any feelings or thoughts about that? If that's bad, if this is kind of something taking us down a, a, a wrong path? Um, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that actually. And I said genetically modified, it's not, it's not that they've introduced a gene from a different organism. It's just that they've sort of, they've fooled around with the genes, cut them out, but uh, it's, it's, it's the same yeast that they're using. So I'm not, I'm not worried about some Frankenstein organism. I think it's, you know, it's all done in a safe situation. I know there are issues in terms of like, um, you know, all the farmers who are now involved in the, and laborers involved in the palm oil industry. Um, and in my book, I argue that again, as you were talking about, this, is, this has gotta be a global effort. So yeah, Indonesia, the Indonesian and Malaysian governments get really mad when you start sort of dump, dumping on the palm oil industry because they say, who are you rich countries to dump on our, and you're oppressing all our farmers. So I understand those economies are, are very, you know, they're very invested in this industry. And sort of the same way we need to help coal miners in, in Appalachia and, you know, fossil fuel workers. We need, to, we need to rethink these things and subsidize them to keep their tropical rainforest standing and to shift to 
other industry, you know, better, better crops that are going to be more nutritious and, you know, agroecology systems that are going to preserve the land. But um, so I think, again, none of these is like a silver bullet. I think all of them, you need to look at sort of the ramifications in terms of labor issues and environmental issues. But I do, I'm, I think synthetic palm oil sounds like a great idea to me, um, you know, assuming that it's all done in a, in a safe context. And I think it is. Out of all your experiences, would you say that your um, Greenpeace experience was the craziest, most hair raising, or was it uh, the other one you, uh, I don't think it was the Greenpeace one where you went into um, another country and kind of- Undercover? Find, yeah, kind of undercover and find out about that, but you're like, oh, okay, this is, can you tell us wh which one was kind of the most hair raising for you? and and just uh, what what your what your thoughts and your experiences were there and and so the green people I, I actually wasn't there just to tell your listeners that I told the story of, of how the, the Greenpeace activists pulled up next to a tanker um, off the coast of Spain um, and threw a threw a, a a ladder up the side of it and they climbed up there were six of them they wanted to occupy this tanker and um, and the captain came out and said I'm gonna you know I'm gonna beat you up, I'm gonna throw you overboard. Um, they were put in the Suez cabin, uh, they call this little cabin. They didn't know where they were going, what was gonna happen. Basically, I just interviewed a bunch of Greenpeace people who were there uh, and then sort of recreated that. Um, it was an amazing story. They finally ended up in a little town in Spain and they, they called in the cops and they, they let them go, but they were terrified. They didn't know what was gonna happen. Um, and, but in Sumatra, I did go undercover with these guys. It's a group called um, Eyes on the Forest. And um, they're amazing. They, um, they pose as sort of businessmen or bird watchers um, or sort of environmental worker, extension workers with palm oil companies. And they go, so we talked a little bit earlier about how the, um, the industry is very corrupt. So lots of times there's sort of absentee businessmen who are you know collecting all the money and, and running things, but it's the farmers on the ground who are, um, who are tending the trees and might not realize that they're doing it on illegal land. Um, anyway, so these guys sort of go undercover into these very remote areas and talk to people and figure out sort of what's going on. Um, the other thing is the industry, a lot of the, the companies say, oh, our, our palm oil is sustainable because we've traced it to the mill. Um, so the fruit is collected on the plantations. It goes to the mill for processing into oils and then the oils go to the refinery for further processing. And you need to basically process the fruits within 24 hours or they go rancid. So the idea if they say it's, it's traced to the mill, they assume that if it's being processed at this mill, it must have come from a certain radius because you would need to travel within 24 hours. Well, the, the folks behind it find a lot of ways around it. So they might get um, oil palm fruit that's being grown on a, on a national park where they, they cut down the trees and then they just race through the night um, sometimes they change their license plates and change their drivers to show up at the mill, pass the guy at the mill, a little money, no, no questions asked or where this palm oil is coming from. So yeah, it was, it was me and I think it was six guys. It was four um, investigators and then two drivers. We had two vehicles and it was very interesting. They didn't speak any English. I don't speak Bahasa Indonesia. We were together for five or six days. Um, so I did, there was one translator, but his English wasn't very good either. So it was, it was um, there was a lot of comedy involved in just sort of um, communicating with each other, but it was amazing to see their work. They were very, um, they're very meticulous about not just sort of, you know, we would, we would sort of go race behind these trucks that had oil palm food that we knew was from an illegal place. Um, and then they also, they, they were hunched over their computers every morning and they, they have drones and they had, GPS systems, so they were tracking everything. Then they had sort of import information about, you know, what, um, where the, where the soil from this mill, what refinery it was going to, and then what port it ended up in, and then they could trace it to, oh yeah, that ends up in, you know, the products of Colgate, Palm Olive, or PepsiCo, or Unilever. Um, so they figure out, you know, who's doing what in an illegal way, and then they report to these companies, and they say, are you aware that the palm oil you're sourcing from this refinery came from this illegal place, and what are you going to do about it? So they really, they document everything and are able to get these companies to then acknowledge, okay, we don't know where all of our palm oil is coming from and we'll maybe or maybe not try to do something about it. Um, it was it was fun. They were, they were such pros that I wasn't, um, I wasn't really scared with them. I was scared. I, I give the scene at the very beginning of the chapter 
before we sort of went out on the road with them when I had just arrived, um, they said, we need to get clearance from the, um, who's like the provincial governor. So we went into the office and I had, um, I had binoculars around my neck and uh, um, like a bird watching book. I, I said I was there to um, see the orangutans and the birds. And I, my heart was pounding when, when this guy, he was just sitting behind his desk smoking a cigarette. He was like, what, what are you here? You know, what are you doing? Um, anyway, we got out, I got, they gave us like the certificate that it was okay for me to be in the district. And then, and then we went off. Crazy. Yeah. The, I mean, but even when, when they get to the refineries, the refinery is not that sustainable or not that great of a place. I mean, isn't there a lot of toxins and chemicals and kind of emissions going off at these refineries? I've seen uh, not just, I don't think uh, I saw any from yours, but I've seen a bunch of other uh, palm oil refinery processing mills and that. There are horrible working conditions and kind of smelly, awful places is what I see. Smelly. Um, the one I visited, the working conditions seemed okay. It was, it was owned by Wilmar, which is the, the biggest palm oil trader in the world. Also, they, I couldn't get in there without clearance from Wilmar. So certainly they, they took me to a place that was <laughs> that looked nice. Yeah, um, okay. But the mills, the mills, I think are also, those are very smelly. That's where they do in the initial processing. And then they put sort of all the... Um, the sort of sludge that results in these in these pools outside and it's some this one was pretty well run they had it they had it managed well but in other places like in guatemala where i reported there was a big rainstorm and and these mil, these pools overflowed and um there, there was a fish kill for miles and miles just millions of, of dead fish floating from all the toxins that had been in that stuff so some yeah. some are run much better than others obviously yeah i've seen that before and that sludge is is really rough stuff so wow that that's interesting and i sh uh, again um well i want to encourage everybody to, to go out there and get the book but i want to ask you um what your biggest takeaways or hope is for those who read the book that you would like to give them you know one or two takeaways that was really your hope to achieve by coming out with the book. Uh -huh. So to understand that palm oil is in um, so many of our foods and other um, products, and to understand um, what goes into it in terms of environmental issues, human rights issues, labor issues, and to um, you know call out the companies, tell them that, that you care, that you know that this is there and you know um, what's involved and you want them to reform or that you're not going to buy their products. Um, and again, you, most of these, these companies have palm oil policies. You can read about the sort of consumer facing companies like Unilever or PepsiCo. If you go on their websites, they have a, a palm oil policy. Um, you can read it, you can call them on it. That A lot of them have sort of um, grievance mechanisms too. If there have been um, abuses that have been documented by some of these NGOs, they're sort of tracking them. Uh, I think that they assume, sometimes they don't they don't change them for you know years. They assume nobody's really keeping track. But um, so I would say yeah, get call out the companies, tell them you know you want to you want to see their policies, you want to know what's in, what's involved in the um, the sourcing of this ingredient. And then the other thing I would say is to go to the websites of some of these organizations that are really focused on these issues. And um, not just focused on the issues from like New York and San Francisco, but they're working really closely with the folks on the ground um, in these communities who are being impacted. So the Rainforest Action Network, Mighty Earth, Greenpeace, Amnesty International. If you go on those websites and look at sort of click on palm oil, and then you can get involved in some of those campaigns, um, social media campaigns to, to raise awareness. And again, I think if the, the industry has gotten away with this, all this shit for so long, because nobody knows anything about it. And I think if people start to realize and say, hello, uh, we know what's going on here and we don't want to stand for it the way it is anymore. I'm glad that uh, we have wonderful people like you out there raising the awareness and, and, and putting that out there and getting, you know, going through the hard work and research and also uh, being on the ground to, to figure out all this so that you can bring us this wonderful book. And I, I have, um, I want to kind of move into some other questions now. So I think we pretty much covered the book as, as much as we're going to cover it and, and teased it, I, I hope, enough for those to go out and look at the show note descriptions and the links on where they can get the book themselves. 
I have some other questions for you that are kind of more moving into food and activism and what you've been doing, other things you've been doing over the years. Um, but the biggest one is the burning question. It's the WTF is the burning question. And it's not the swear word that probably this past uh, 15, 18 months, a lot of us have been saying because of the pandemic. It's really, what is your vision and your thoughts of the future moving forward for um, whether it's, I really want to know for you and your family and kind of moving forward, what your thoughts and your plan on the future is. And, and the reason I ask that question is um, if you don't have a roadmap, if you don't know what the future is, you're kind of like just adrift and you're going wherever your government, your country kind of takes you. And so I want to know what are your thoughts and feelings? Are we going to go, are we going to continue to have to do um, things like uh, palm, pl planet palm type of books to raise awareness about every product out there on the market? Or do you think there's some bigger shifts on getting us to better futures out there uh, than we currently have seen? Um, I'll start on sort of the personal level. I would say I was listening to a, um, a radio show yesterday. There was a guy who just wrote a book about um, environmental issues, climate change, I guess. And he was talking about how our sort of our comfort level has changed. Like People just have the air conditioning on all the time in the car, in their house. He was in Brooklyn. He said, I haven't had it on. He said, I turned it on once last year because it was like 100 degrees or something. But um, so I think I think all of us sort of on the on the personal level just need to realize that we need to change. We can't just be, you know, living like the resources are endless. Um, and that would also entail not eating meat all the time. You know, just I, I don't think you have to absolutely go vegan, but I think you need to really cut down on your meat and dairy animal products. It's just, you know, the, the data is there. We just, it's, it's taking up too much, too many resources. So um, that would, that I would say on a personal level, on the sort of um, policy level, I do think there's a shift. I mean, you would know better than I being involved in um, UN issues and the World Economic Forum, but um, I do think governments, Western governments are realizing sort of the importance of, you know, tropical rainforests and, starting to put policies in place that acknowledge that um, and that, um, you know, rewards the, the governments of the, of the companies that, that are home to these precious um, ecosystems. Um, so during Biden's climate summit, um, he announced, you probably heard the announcement of this um, organization or this initiative called LEAF, lowering emissions, you know, the, anyway, it's basically a carbon yeah, trade. Okay. It's like a red yeah. plus, but much improved. And it's and it's the governments of the um, of the U.S., Norway, EU, UK, I think, and also a bunch of big companies, um, Airbnb, Amazon, a bunch of others. So I think also this sort of private public thing. Uh, people are skeptical when you get um, corporations involved, but I do think we need all hands on deck um, initiatives like that. Um, and I know there are also legislation moving through the government here and in the UK in terms of um, commodities linked to deforestation and sort of really clamping down much much more on being able to trace where these commodities, including palm oil, are coming from and if they're linked to illegal deforestation or um, human rights abuses, labor abuses. So, um, but I do, think, I do think books like this, you know, social media campaigns, it's, it's in our power, right, to say we care about these things, otherwise, corporations and, and governments, you know, are not likely to pay attention if they don't have to. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely vital. I mean, like I mentioned before, you know, Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring and, and um, Maria Rodell um, Organic Manifesto and many, many others are out there that are raising awareness about what's going on that most people really just don't have that connection to food, but also how the food industries and systems work, how they've been set up and, and how many people's lives they affect and the health and the environment. So I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're addressing that. And, and I hope to see many other works come, come from you and uh, down the road, not just in magazines, articles, but maybe some, some other great things. There are a couple of other questions in line with WTF that I want to ask. And, and that is, similar but a little bit different what does a world 
that works for everyone look like for you? Um, probably, I, I feel like in my, I'm, I'm very privileged here in Brooklyn um, and that my family uses more resources than we should. I talk about in the book that I was a um, Peace Corps volunteer in a little village in Western Kenya and there was no, no electricity, no running water. And I, and I mentioned that I was so happy there. Part of it was, um, I said, the, the absence of extraneous anything. Like I did, you know, I didn't, I didn't generate garbage. I just ate fresh food and it was so simple. It was so, um, I loved it. You know, I feel like there's so much shit in our lives. I don't need all this shit. I don't know. I don't know how I get back there, but um, it's somewhere between the, the here and there. Um, I just, I like a more I'm a simpler life, I think. Yeah, I, I, I can tell that as well. I'm, I've, I've moved over the years quite a few times. Um, I live in Germany now, but I'm from the States. And, and through each of those moves, I can always declutter, de-junk, get rid of some stuff. And, and it's like, just such a freeing feeling. I get all this stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> when did that happen? I don't need it. I don't need all this stuff. It's, it's just freeing and it's just a lot simpler life. But yeah, I mean, I, 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 like you, I think I probably have this book addiction. I have so many books and this is a tapestry, but if you look everywhere else in my office, it's wall to wall books. And I just, it's, it's an addiction, but I love the physical touch of books. Yeah. What, what was that? That's one addiction I would defend. Yeah. Yeah. It's a and it's a hard one when you move it's because a boy, but um, yeah, yeah, but I, but I actually, I, I love it. I, I actually printed two books, um, both done on rock paper, which is calcium carbonate. So it's, oh. it's like a seashells, calcium carbonate. Still, also not the best environmentally, but better than cutting down trees. They. They, you can read them in the bathtub, I guess that's a benefit, or you can write on them. Uh, uh, I don't know, but yeah, uh, I'm not sure if I'm I'm convinced on that transition yet, but but maybe soon. I, I do do a lot of digital books as well. Um, the last three questions I have for you are really for my listeners, and they're more for them to kind of get a little insight on on how they can improve or what they could apply into their lives if there was one message or even two that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life what would it be your message mm -hmm. i think i think to eat thoughtfully to to um you know think about what you're eating where it came from uh, its impact on your body and on the environment and on the folks that produced it um i think that so that might that Michael Pollan adage, you know, eat, eat food. And when he says food, he said basically anything, you know, your, that your, your grandparents knew about, you know, if it's some, some multisyllabic thing, um, that's not, that's not food. That's some corporate um, invention. Anyway, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I think he, he nails it there. Yeah, he does. I really love that. What should young freelance writers or writers or researchers who, uh, or even young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real impact? I, I think thinking holistically. I think we can't, we can't sort of, you know, attack any problem in isolation. We can't think about the food system or health or animal welfare um, isolated from all these other things because it's all so connected in increasingly so, and in terms of um, geography as well. Sort of, you can't, you can't fix something in New Jersey and you know, not worry about what's happening in Indonesia. It needs to be a holistic. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Uh, that the magazine industry was going to collapse. <laughs> That's um, you know, there's just. A, I was a longtime magazine editor and it was, it was really fun work. Um, and there's just so, few, so many fewer, all the magazines that I worked for no longer exist. Um, and that's really sad to me. I mean, um, I understand things have gone digital, um, but I think it's also, you know, the, the Facebooks and the Googles, you know, where the advertising money is going. And um, anyway, that's sort of sarcastic, um, but more seriously, I guess, 
pursue the the work that you love that you feel is you know if you don't believe in it um it's not gonna be fun you gotta you gotta feel like you're doing something that matters i'm not even sure if it's bad that that that, that is sarcastic and because there's a, there's also some truth in it because i'm not sure the the digital versions has really replaced that sus sustenance or that uh, true journalistic styles or even some of the, the, the publications you've written for or edited. Right. And it's, not just, it's not just magazines. I mean, it's local, it's local news, local newspapers, you know, yeah. being bought up by hedge funds and then just being, being gutted. So there are so many um, journalists now who are out of work and that's lo local journalism is really important to know what's going on, you know, on the ground. Um, so yeah, we need to sort of address that moving forward. I truly agree. Jocelyn, thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you let me just speak to you, relax like you're right next next to me. And, and I wish you all the best. And now I, I'm done with my questions, but if you have anything else that you would like to add on the book that we didn't get a cover, um, now is your chance. Otherwise, I really thank you for your time and I hope we can have have another podcast follow up maybe next year when you come out with some other good surprises. Thank you so much, Mark. I've loved talking to you and thank you for all your amazing work. I appreciate it. And you have a wonderful day. Take care. Watch you too. Bye. Bye.